So really, no guesses on my artwork? I have absolutely no idea what no that idea. is. It actually is a depiction of a real event. And here's, an, here's a clue, so this might help you. Now, I assume because you, you are taking a dance class that you also know about the visual arts, but that might be a false assumption on my part. Um, on the day after Halloween, on Monhegan Island, Maine, all of the islanders go to the bluffs and heave their jack-o'-lanterns off into the ocean. Oh. Mm. So that's what this is. Do we know the artist? He is the third generation of Amer an American artistic dynasty. Oh, uh, um, why? Jamie Wyeth, who has a major retrospective. I actually saw this at the MFA about a month ago. Did you? Now I feel bad. <laughs> you should feel bad. You should feel very, very bad. And we'll shame you every five minutes for the rest of the class. Oh. <laughs> um, Wait, is it Jamie Wyeth from Bucks County? Yeah, but they Maine is the other. They yeah, they from live Bucks in County. Maine. Oh. So I really do. So you have no idea. Yeah, you should so if you get a chance, go to the MFA and see the retrospective. This is the first retrospective of Jamie Wyeth's work. It is, it's stunning. Did you love the seven deadly seagulls? Did you like the seven deadly seagulls? Yeah, that was very cool. Um, and if there's a really cute um, tour guide there with her little university badge on, that's my daughter Kelsey. Ask her hard questions and she'll tell you everything about everything. Because in that way of college students, she knows it all. Um, I have high expectations. See, you didn't, Rachel didn't tell you when she uh, said, oh, invite Jane to this class that I like to hear myself talk, so I'll just like go on and on about anything. Forever. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you my Brown University connection, and then I'll tell you a funny story about this PowerPoint, which the real version for your class is titled something different. This is not it. But my uncle Herman um, used to teach here. Um, and his area of specialty was the history of education. And he wrote literally the most boring book on the planet. And every year when they do all, like, all the faculty books, I walk by the bookstore and it'll be in the window there. And I think, oh, please, God, nobody's making anybody read that thing again, because it is. It's called The University of Rhode Island, A History of Land-Grant Education in America by Herman F. Eschenbacher. It's, it's an interesting subject. It's fascinating. Fascinating. To some. <laughs> not to me. I grew up hearing about it, so not so much to me. Um, OK, so uh, um, I came to talk to you guys today about autism and about um, the Grodin Center and um, evidence-based practice. And I actually um, met Rachel, is it two years ago? Yeah. Two years ago, and I got a phone call that said, we're doing this artists and scientists in partnership thing, and these dance for Parkinson's people are going to be there, and we want you to come and be on this panel. And I, I said, but you know I'm a behavior analyst, right? <laughs> she said, yes, so we want you to come and be on this panel. And, um, I had to keep checking with people that I hadn't been mistakenly invited to something that I, I shouldn't actually be coming and talking to, because I am a behavior analyst, but um, apparently it all works, so I'm, I'm good with it. So, you were great. thank you. And I also, as I let everybody know one, two years ago when I talked, I'm an excellent dancer. And there's probably like Facebook evidence right up now from my niece's wedding this weekend, where um, the crazy aunties displayed their dancing prowess. Um, so just give me a little 70s funk and soul, and I'm good to go. Um, yeah, so I should have put a little Parliament Funkadelic in this, and then we could all have a party. All right, so let's talk about autism. And I'm going to give you an introduction to sort of my take on things. Um, and I always start my lectures with this quote from Max Weber, and you get extra bonus points if you know who Max Weber was. Anybody take philosophy? No? No? Um, Max Weber is considered one of the fathers of contemporary psychology. Uh, By refractor was, law? Yeah. Yes. Perception yeah. and intensity. Yeah. Uh. You'll see you've redeemed yourself now for not knowing who Jamie Wyeth was. Good. I'm glad. 
Um, it is disturbing to me as a parent, though, that you're putting that cheese right on top of your computer, like it's a little table. <laughs> Oh, really? It's a whole, like, a, I didn't know that this could double as, like, a little dinner tray, but now I've learned something. I'm glad. I have some takeaways. <laughs> I have some takeaways already from this class, so that's good. Um, good, we're going to have fun. So, um, Max Faber said there are three sources of people's beliefs, tradition, charisma, and reason and science. And the reason I always lead with this, this quote is because of, come on, this. Come on, why is this not catching up? There we go. So I, uh, every time I lecture, I update this, a little Google search. So if you go on Google today and search autism, you get 71,600,000 hits. That's a lot. If you Google autism treatment, you'll, you'll only, you're down to 61,100,000. So that's easier to sift through. Um, autism intervention, even further down, 11,700,000. Autism cure. Thankfully, only has 5,700,000 hits. <laughs> autism therapy, over 18 million, and autism education, over 30 million. So what we know in this computer-driven age is that when you go to a doctor and he tells you something, or you suspect something, the first thing you do is go on the computer and look it up. So if you are a parent who suspects that your child may have an autism spectrum disorder, and you enter autism into your Google search, this is what you come up with. How in the world would you even begin to identify what is useful information when you're sort of knocked on the head with these kind of numbers? Um, and you know, the reality is the best stuff doesn't come up first. As I'm sure you guys know way more than I do how you get things to come up first on <laughs> yeah yeah if you pay people if you advertise with them you can even get like a little yellow square around you um, but again that's not necessarily the good information it's just some information um, so you know I think it's really important for any of us who are um, working with people with autism interested in autism um, repeating something that we heard on TV about autism. Understand the source of that information. And now you get to have my uh, five minute lecture on philosophy of science, because I like philosophy of science as well. Um, so these are the systems of truth. This is how we decide whether or not something that we see or hear is true or not. Um, there are three of them. The authoritarian system basically means that somebody that you perceive to know something about an area is telling you something, so therefore it must be true. So today I'm going to tell you a lot of things, and probably you're going to assume that what I'm telling you is true, because I've been invited here by people in your class who know me a little bit from coming to see me in my office. Um, but really, how do you know that what I'm telling you is true? Is it my charming personality, you know? Constantly uh, fact check me while you speak. That's, that's right. That's why you've all got your computers open. You're going to check on every single thing that I say. Um, you have a lot of information to shift, sift through, though, so I know I've got a little bit of lead time. Um, so, you know, where do you commonly see the authoritarian system of truth? Often in advertising, you know, all those nine out of ten dentists surveyed recommend Crest. Well, they didn't tell you what they surveyed them about. It could just be that. They like the blue box or something, you know, but they've, so we believe, oh yeah, they must know what's happening. Um, I actually had a professor in grad school who knew a lot of things, but when we, he would get annoyed with us in class if we asked him too many questions and he'd say, I just told you that that's what it is, so just leave me alone. And we're like, hmm, <laughs> that doesn't seem right. <laughs> Aren't you supposed to teach us to ask questions about things? Um, but anyway, sometimes we believe things because somebody tells us. If you know, somebody gives me a whole bunch of facts about the weather, who am I to question if, you know, if they're a meteorologist? I assume they know something. Um, phenomenology is, basically means that you yourself have experienced something, and therefore it's true, which seems pretty reasonable, right? Because it happens to you, so 
that must be right. Do you know the biggest problem with phenomenology? Distortion of perception? Mm-hmm, yeah. What we behavior analysts call superstitious behavior. So we as humans like to connect events and assume that there's a causal relationship between events. And I'll give you an example of this. When I was in grad school, I had this really old uh, Volvo station wagon that when I bought it, it had 365,000 miles on it. It, was, it. it had these big rust spots on the top because this guy who used to go fishing owned it and used to put his boat on top of it and all the salt water would drip off on top of the car. It was, it was noisy, it was horrible, the heat only worked marginally, and it wouldn't start when it rained. But sometimes I could get it to start when it rained by doing certain things. So if it wouldn't start, if I jiggled the steering wheel back and forth a few times and then tried to start it and turned the radio on and off a couple of times and pounded on the dashboard and did all these things in a particular sequence, it would start. So I actually eventually scrounged together enough money to take it to a mechanic. And we had this mechanic who used to work on all the grad students cars, um, Kenny, the mechanic, and he you know, said, what's the problem? I said, it won't start when it rains. He said, well, is there anything you can do to get it to start? I'm like, well, yes, thank you for asking, because I think this is really important information. I can jiggle the steering wheel back and forth. I can turn the radio on and off a couple of times and like hit the dashboard, and then it will start. He's like, okay. He opened up the hood. And he closed the hood, he said, you're one of those psychology grad students, right? I'm like, yeah. He goes, of all that, you take data and stuff? Yeah. He said, um, it has nothing to do with any of that stuff that you were talking about, including the rain. Like, what are you talking about? Of course it does. It doesn't start when it rains, and then I can do this stuff and get it started. He said, no, no, no. Apparently there was this thing in there called an ignition rotor, and it has teeth on it, and when it engages the teeth, the engine starts. Well, it was missing about half of his teeth, so it was completely random whether or not the car started. <laughs> and in fact, I only thought it didn't start when it rained because our parking lot was about a half a mile from the psychology building. So if it was raining, and I had to schlep all the way out to my car, and there were not cell phones then, and I had to get into my car, and then it wouldn't start. I'd have to walk all the way back to the psychology building to make a call to get the AAA guy to come and start it. So I noticed it much more when it was raining because I would get really wet. Um, so that's phenomenology for you. So it works some of the time. And then the third method is, is the boring method, the empirical method, which relies on verifiable observation, which means I can show you a phenomenon and you will also be able to see it. And you may even be able to replicate it. And other people will be able to replicate it. Um, so whenever we're hearing information about something like autism, particularly as it relates to treatment, we always have to think about where that information comes from. What system of truth are we applying to decide whether or not information that we get is good information? How are we guiding families to make determinations about the information that we're getting, they're getting? Um, another thing to think about in my brief philosophy of science lecture is whether something actually falls into the category of science or if it's pseudoscience or anti-science. And remember, science, verifiable observation. Pseudoscience are things that are dressed up like science. So just because you have a graph doesn't mean that you've actually shown a causal relationship between variables. It just means that you made a nice picture and it's much easier for us to make nice pictures now because we all have computers that can do that like that. You can even make 9,000 versions of your picture and it can be a lot of different colors. But does it actually demonstrate that you have produced some sort of a, a treatment effect? Um, so pseudoscience is often dressed up like science. One of the hallmarks of pseudoscience is um, when the only studies you see about something are published by the author and come out of whatever company it is that he generates his income from, that always should raise a red flag for you, that there's something problematic about that. Um, and then there's flat out anti-science. Those are the people, and there are a lot of them in the autism community, who will say, here's this treatment that I have, 
And don't worry that there aren't any studies because the kinds of gains that I can make with my treatment, you really can't measure with those scientific methods. It's just not necessary. Trust me, it works. And there's a whole lot of that out there. Actually, this morning, a colleague of mine came into my office because he likes to get my blood pressure up in the morning. He says, I saw in Good Morning America this morning that broccoli cures autism. <laughs> I was like, oh, awesome. <laughs> there was something on the news today about autism in infants, something, but I didn't say the card and I didn't hear what it was. was so oh, yeah? Was it, was it from a reliable source? Oh, it was NPR. Again, it's so probably, Bible, probably better. <laughs> Them, them when you drive a lot, yes. your Bible, so, um, yeah. I didn't hear what the story was, so I didn't know if you, you heard it. Yeah, a lot of uh, it, it's, you know a lot of what you see in the popular media is often uh, correlational, uh, and in the the grand scheme of empiricism, correlational research is is step two. That's after you you think maybe you have a good idea about something, you'll look to see if it's correlated with anything else, and then you do actual research after that. So a lot of what you see is correlational stuff. Um, and the reason that you only see it once and it never comes back again is because somebody actually tries to do an investigation that doesn't pan out. Um, but that's true in a lot of fields. It's, you, in cancer research, too, you see tons and tons of correlational data that comes out. And then it's never followed up because when somebody actually does some empirical work, whatever they, they thought they were seeing doesn't hold up. OK, so enough about that. So let's talk a little bit. Do you guys, uh, I don't know how much you sort of know about autism and autism spectrum disorders. So I'll tell you as much or as little as you want to know. So if you know all of this, just tell me to move on, and I will. Don't worry about interrupting or anything. Um, so one of the things that we've got going right now is we have this big shift. We now, uh, the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, is put out occasionally by the American Academy of Psychiatry. And that is a big book of um, basically every uh, psychological mental disorder that you can have and developmental disabilities. So autism is listed under there. And, and up until this most recent version, this is how uh, autism spectrum disorders were listed. They were all grouped as pervasive developmental disorders. And there were five distinct categories, autistic disorder being one. Um, and what we refer to as the autism spectrum was autistic disorder, PDD NOS, NOS always means not otherwise specified, and Asperger's disorder. Um, and those sort of hang together as what we describe as the autism spectrum. Childhood disintegrative disorder is actually very, very rare. Um, and um, I, I've been in the field for uh, way longer than I like to think. Um, but uh, well over 30 years, and I have seen one case of childhood disintegrative disorder in my entire career. Um, typically, these are kids who are gaining skill and then at some point in their life have a sudden loss of skill that is not attributable to any medical condition or other disorder. Often it's associated with very poor outcome and, and serious mental illness later in life as well. Rett's disorder is actually a genetic disorder. Um, that uh, is degenerative over time in terms of motor functioning and occurs mostly in girls. Um, so what happened was when they moved the, to the new DSM-5, they decided to shake things up a little bit and change the classification. And now there is only going to be autism spectrum disorder. So those three things, um, autism, PDD, NOS, and Asperger's, are all going to be called autism spectrum disorder now. Um, it doesn't mean that anything's gone away. The symptoms are still underneath that broad umbrella. But there's not going to be these three distinct diagnostic buckets. But if you were diagnosed with Asperger's prior to when this goes into effect, and this has not been widely adopted in this country yet, you can still keep your diagnostic category. You get grandfathered in as having Asperger's. Um, so uh, a little bit of history. Um, autism was first identified by Leo Kanner in the 40s. Uh, he was working at Johns Hopkins University. And he described a number of cases that he was seeing uh, under this, uh, uh, this label of 
infantile autism. And Kanner, uh, what Kanner thought in the 40s about these kids that he was seeing was that they seemed to have some sort of innate intelligence. So he, he felt that the disorder was not like intellectual disability or what we used to call mental retardation, that these were kids who cognitively were intact, but because of these behaviors that, that we were seeing, this autism, they weren't able to show what it was that they knew, essentially. Um, from Kanner's time through the 50s and actually into the 70s, the, the, the feeling was that um, these kids were like this because of something that their parents had done to them uh, when they were young. That, and not necessarily overtly, but that their, their mothers were, were cold and aloof and um, not particularly interactive, uh, and that is what caused autism uh, in kids. And if that's, if that's what you think causes autism, what would the logical treatment be? To remove, to like some other perfection? Yeah. And the, the first word that you said is actually accurate, the remove. The child. If, yeah, if you take the child out of that environment, then they should be okay. Right? So Bruno, Be Bruno Bettelheim was actually um, one of the leading proponents of this theory. He actually coined the, the term refrigerator mother. And there's actually a great POV uh, video um, called Refrigerator Mothers, which actually chronicles parents of folks with autism who now, are now in their 40s, 50s, and 60s who were told when their kids were little that this, it was their fault, essentially. Uh, and then they were subjected to, the mothers often got intensive psychotherapy, um, and the kids were often removed uh, from their home and, and put in institutions. Bettelheim had um, a, a large institution, and actually in the central courtyard, he had this big sculpture of a reclining woman, um, and they used to encourage the kids to hit it and spit on it and walk all over it and so that they could, um, I don't know, I guess, get back at their mother and become non-autistic. Um, they were never able to adequately describe why only some kids, in the, one kid in a family might have autism and not the other, so if the, if the mother was actually causing this, obviously she was picking one of the kids and not all of them. Um, and then uh, they couldn't, Bettelheim couldn't really explain why kids didn't then recover after they took them away from their parents, um, or why the other parent wouldn't have made up for the problem with the, well, there are a lot of flaws in the theory, let's say. Um, in 1964, Rimland, uh, Bernie Rimland published a book on infantile autism, and this was the first um, sort of very cohesive account as, of autism as having a neurobiological basis. And that continues in contemporary theory. What we know now is that uh, folks on the autism spectrum have neurological differences from typically developing folks. Um, the problem is it, there are a lot of different neurological differences. Uh, so it's not one thing. There's not a medical test that can detect autism. Um, but uh, it, we do know that, that there are neurological differences in everybody who has an autism spectrum disorder. Um, except in France, where they still, still, uh, in France, yes, France. It's a modern European country. Psychoanalysis rules the psychology field in France still. Um, no cognitivism, no behavior analysis, nothing. And in France, kids on the autism spectrum are still basically identified as having become autistic because their parents are basically doing something to cause this. Um, It's, it's baffling to me that, that it could be this way. But. I mean, it's so cultural, but yeah. it's such a cultural like outcome. Yeah, and uh, you know, in, in France, if you have a child on the autism spectrum, your child is not, they're not required to, to school your child. Really? Really. That's yeah. 
Yeah, so they stay at home or you pay big dollars out of your pocket to get somebody to provide a... Until program. nine years ago, kids with AIDS couldn't use private school, public schools in France. And this was nine years ago. People with AIDS couldn't go to school. Yeah, so it's... Well, I'm, I'm glad to get some confirmation of, you know, strange, strange things happen in France. Um, so, and, and um, in terms of treatment, essentially psychotherapy, particularly for the parent, gradually gave way to more behavioral approaches uh, to therapy. So what are, the, what are the behaviors that we're seeing? What are the skill deficits that we're seeing? Let's work on building some skills. Uh, and then in 1987, it was really a turning point in the, in the field. Uh, Ivar Lovas from UCLA published the first outcome study of um, intensive behavioral treatment for young children with autism. And um, in 1987, I had been working professionally in the field for five years. I worked with kids with autism um, every day. And his study was published. And basically what he did was compare two groups of kids. Uh, one group of kids got very intensive uh, behavioral therapy that went on for two to three years, starting when they were between two and three years old. The other group, so they got that for 40 hours or more a week. The other group got 10 hours a week or less of the same treatment. And what he found was that of the group that got the very intensive treatment, 47% of those kids, IQs came up into the normal range, their language functioning came up into the average range, and behaviorally, they became virtually indistinguishable from their peers and they went on to regular kindergarten and first grade. Of the group that got 10 hours or less, less than 10% of those kids had that same outcome. And the lion's share of those kids ended up uh, requiring very significant intervention um, for the rest of their lives. Now in 1987, when this study came out, nobody believed it. And because it was the first study of its kind, Really, there wasn't the preponderance of empirical evidence to cause the field to shift and say, yes, this is the treatment of choice. Uh, it took many, many years um, for replication studies to come out. Um, and now, it's, very, it's a very well-established finding that if you get kids on the autism spectrum when they're young enough and you do intensive enough treatment, you can achieve very good outcomes in a significant percentage of those kids. So in the 40s when, um, when Kanner was doing his work in this country, Hans Asperger was doing his work in Europe. And um, basically what, what Asperger was doing was identifying the whole spectrum, uh, whereas uh, Kanner was working very narrowly with this group of kids who were pretty significantly uh, impacted. Um, so Asperger, <coughs> identified in the 40s what we came to refer to as the autism spectrum. Um, and now it's just under DSM-5 just called autistic disorder. Um, and his work was first uh, generally introduced to the public by Lorna Wing in the early 80s. So um, you know his work was not widely known for a long time. And it wasn't until 1994 that it first made it into our, our DSM manuals here in this country, whereas it had been recognized in Europe for many, many years before that. And now it's gone again. Um, the whims of the DSM. So now, so it was that 1994 to 2013. And now we no longer have Asperger's in this country. Uh, okay. So, so what is it that causes autism? Well, we know it's not the mom. So, so what is it? And this is one of the, the, the problems that the field still has. Uh, we don't have a good answer for what is it, other than something has gone wrong neurologically. And whatever it is happened very early on. Uh, there are, if you get into the genetics literature, the medical literature, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of studies looking at uh, cell division, there are various neural structures, um, various 
clusters of genes. Um, and again, what they're not finding is something that's sort of a unifying theme throughout the whole spectrum. So it seems as if there are many, many different things that are causing the cluster of behaviors that we call autism, um, but we still don't have a very good understanding. And this is one of the reasons that I think when you go onto Google, you get 71 million hits. Um, because if we had much more clarity about what it is that caused it, I think people would be much less likely to sort of grasp at uh, whatever it is that, that, that comes along. Uh, I know, uh, you know, as a, as a parent of a typically developing child, if she, were, if she had something like autism, I would want to know what it is that, that caused it. Um, so in the genetics fields, early studies uh, showed that there is heritability. Uh, autism definitely seems to run in some families. Um, there are a lot of twin studies out there now. Well, not a lot because it's twin research, so there's only so many you can get. But um, the early studies showed a 94% concordance rate in monozygotic twins, which is very high. The interesting thing, though, is that one of the twins could have very severe autism, um, and the other twin could have Asperger's syndrome. So there was not concordance on symptomatology or outcome, um, but just on being on the spectrum. <clears throat> um, so again, most researchers believe that there isn't a single cause, that there are a lot of things that produce the cluster of symptoms that we call autism. Okay. Ooh. So what are, oh, let me I'll go back to that, sorry. So what are some of the things that you'll hear, though? Uh, uh, vaccines, has everybody heard about vaccines? Yeah, I got, <laughs> I got my flu shot yesterday, and of course we had to send, uh, we had a flu clinic at one of our schools, and one of the teachers came in and said, this parent wants to know that there's not thimerosal in this vaccine, which is a, a uh, mercury-based preservative, and in fact there isn't, um, and in fact there isn't in all child vaccines now in this country. Um, it, it's not vaccines. Uh, there are very, very good studies from all over the world that show that it's not vaccines. It's not some big cover-up by the CDC. Um, Actually, Iceland is where some of these best studies come from because it's a relatively small population. They have really good socialized medicine, so they get all kinds of data on everybody in the country. And they know exactly in Iceland when thimerosal became an ingredient in the vaccines, when it stopped being an ingredient in the vaccines, when they did the triple jab versus the single jab. So they know all of that. And there were no changes related to any of those things in the vaccines. That being said, there is a risk to getting any vaccine. So is it possible that someone could have had a severe reaction to a vaccine or someone could today have a severe reaction to a vaccine and end up with the cluster of behavioral symptoms that we call autism? Yes. It is very, very tiny. So, you know, people point to the, the uh, you know, upward trajectory that the, the prevalence rates of autism are at now and say it's, it's vaccines. It's not vaccines. Uh, Gastrointestinal issues, gut brain problems people often talk uh, about. Um, again, there's no data that, that uh, demonstrates that. And in fact, one of the studies um, that everybody points to uh, by this guy, Andrew Wakefield, um, it actually turned out many years later that he had faked his data. So he had actually published a study that showed that uh, actually subsequent to the MMR vaccine, that kids developed gastrointestinal issues and autism. Um, but yeah, it was not true. He lives in Texas now, by the way. He used to live in Great Britain. Huh? No. No, no, no. Texas. He lives in Texas. He's from Great Britain. Um, uh, allergies. Uh, people have said exposure to heavy metals, mercury in particular, um, all kinds of things. Um, and none of them have panned out when you actually do the research. Um, but, you know, how do we explain these big changing rates? When I was in an undergrad uh, getting my degree in special education, it was one in 10,000 kids had an autism, had autism. 
and now it's actually one in 68, uh, the CDC's new numbers. So how do we explain that? Well, it's not easy to explain that. Um, pe some people say we're overdiagnosing, but the, the best um, numbers show that the increases in prevalence basically coincided with our um, expanding of the diagnostic category. So when it was one in 10,000, we were using Kanner's definition of autism, and now we're using Asperger's definition of autism. So it's a much broader uh, group of people that we're capturing. Also, many, many uh, folks who are now diagnosed as autism used to be diagnosed as having mental retardation. Uh, and now they're classified under autism spectrum disorder. So we've gotten a little more sophisticated in our diagnoses. Um, autism is an equal opportunity disability. It occurs pretty equally across all racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic groups. Um, so if you, you know, wherever they're diagnosing, you'll find basically the same numbers. Boys outnumber girls by four or five to one. This is not unique to autism, though. This is common to many developmental disabilities. Genetically, boys are the weaker sex. Um, and it's true. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, OK, so um, I'm going to just talk about some core features uh, quickly. And then I, I want to sort of get into probably some stuff that will be a little more interesting to you guys. So what is it that, that, that leads us to diagnose kids with, with autism spectrum disorder? And this is the new classification system. So criterion A is that you have to have a deficit in social communication and social interaction. And this really plays itself out in a number of ways for kids across the spectrum. For kids with very severe autism, you'll see some of the very classic symptoms of autism, like not wanting to make eye contact. Um, being very isolated, not um, approaching uh, other people in their environment uh, when they need something, using people like tools. Uh, we used to refer to a, a behavior that we called autistic leading, which is where a child with autism needed something and would literally just come up to an adult, grab them by the hand, take them and put their hand on whatever it is that they wanted, and then wait for it to be produced. So there's no social interaction. It was just that person is the vehicle through which I can get something. To folks with Asperger's syndrome who have difficulty understanding uh, gesture and facial expression and how it contributes to communication in the conversation, uh, which is a very significant disability. Let's take something really simple like how close do you stand to someone when you talk to them? How close do you stand? What's the rule? College guidelines are arm's length. <laughs> arm's length? Is that Provided is that in by the, the manual? Office of Student Life. Yep. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> really? Did you Google that? <laughs> 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 they walk around like like a zombie. Oh, because they were tired. They couldn't see. <laughs> Actually, we're having a zombie simulation going on right now. No joke. It's pretty serious. Excellent. Um, so, uh, you know, arm's length is an okay rule. Do we stand arm's length away from everybody that we talk to? No. Some people you stand much closer to. Uh, I was actually pinned to a wall by my ex-husband's aunt and uncle who were close talking to me at this wedding that I was at this weekend. And I'm like, please step away. You're way too close to me. Um, we all have different comfort levels. And remarkably, the people in our environment typically stay about the right distance away from us when they're talking to us. How do they know? Body, body cues. Exactly. Exactly. We communicate through our facial expression, our body posture, very subtle things that we do. And we, as the receiver of that communication, use this tiny little area of our frontal lobes to make these really split-second social decisions that we're not even aware that we're making. But because neurologically we're intact, we can do that. So we decide pretty immediately when we're talking to someone how close to stand to them. Now, if you're someone with Asperger's syndrome, and I have witnessed this myself, and you've seen in the high school hallway, 
child with Asperger's walks up to a friend to tell him something, gets a little too close. What does the friend do? What does the kid with Asperger's do? <laughs> Until the friend is against the wall and is no longer your friend because <laughs> you're talking too close. Um, so all of these nonverbal communicative behaviors are just whoosh, lost on uh, many folks on the spectrum. Um, many folks who do learn these nonverbal communicative forms process them much more slowly and seem very awkward and sort of stilted in their interactions because of it. Um, Which is why it's no mystery that number three occurs, which is difficulty making friends and maintaining relationships, essentially. Because many folks who are um, functioning really well on the spectrum just have a lot of difficulty interpreting what's going on in the social world. It's, it's a very daunting task. Um, Actually, in the, in the verbal communication part of this, I worked with a kid in, in, uh, in New York who was a high school student who had done very, very well, um, was really doing well in class, and, and um, when I would go and consult in his building, he would always avoid me because he knew that it wasn't a good idea to be seen with that autism lady. So he was very sophisticated about that. He never went to the special education room because he knew that he didn't want anybody to see him going in there. So I got a call one day that he was in there and he was very upset. So I knew something really bad must have happened. So I went to his school and talked with him and the problem that had occurred was that a girl in the hallway had told him that he was hot. And his response was, no I'm not, I wouldn't be wearing this sweatshirt if I was hot. And he knew right away that that was not the right thing to say, but he couldn't quite figure out where his error was and uh, you know, immediately went, was very upset to his teacher. He knew that that was the wrong thing to say. What should he have said instead? Uh, she explained to him over and over that it meant that the girl thought that he was cute and he had to be reassured. Maybe he really was hot. He, the nurse took his temperature. No, he was fine. Um, you know, and this went on for literally two hours. And then he was angry that someone would trip him up like that. Why did she say that? Why would she say that to me? If she thought I was cute, why didn't she just say I was cute? Why did she say that I was hot and then make me this upset? So he really couldn't get it. Um, younger kids on the spectrum, who, who picks their nose here? Really? That's what fish is for. Yeah. That's what your mother tells you anyway, right? Yeah. <laughs> Who picks their nose? The real answer is everybody on the planet picks their nose. When you're four, you're just doing it. By the time you're six, you swear to God that you never do it. What changes? Social, social expectation. Exactly. Yeah, social expectation. When I used to do a lot of school consultation, and the array of things that the teachers would complain about about the kids, always on the list was, can you get that kid to stop picking their nose? If you don't respond to the social cues, you then become the kid who picks their nose in class. And that's not a good thing to be socially. It doesn't help you when you're trying to make friends. Um, but again, if you don't access those social cues, you know, nobody says to you, Okay, here's the thing. Now that you're in kindergarten, <laughs> don't pick your nose anymore. You have to hide it. <laughs> or people won't like you. Nobody ever says that. It's not like this thing that goes on in the locker room at the local elementary school. But we all have figured it out just by responding. Okay, so what are the, some of the core features that are affecting kids? And these are very important. Number one is imitation. When do typically developing kids start imitating? Who's taken Psych 101? Child development. From birth. Exactly. From birth. I know her. She's, she's wicked smart. Um, 
from birth, kids imitate. And then they use imitation. We, we use imitation now. When's the last time you spaced out in class? Like five minutes ago. Um, <laughs> What's the first thing you do? You know, you're at a meeting. You're like, oh, wow, I was just lost for a little. What's the first thing you do? You look at what the person next to you is doing. Am I sort of where I'm supposed to be? Um, you know? <laughs> How do you, I remember when my daughter was in high school. She loves it when I talk about her and when I lecture to her. Um, you know, she would spend hours getting ready to go somewhere with all of her friends and she'd be, you know, convinced that she had this completely unique outfit and all of her friends would come over and they would all look exactly the same. Imitation, social imitation. It's a tool that we use to learn. It's how we regulate our social behavior. If you go to another country, watch what the other people do. If you're sitting at a restaurant and you have 9,000 pieces of silverware, do you wait for someone else to start or do you know exactly what to do? You know, we figure out what to do by watching people around us. Many, many, many folks on the autism spectrum do not imitate spontaneously. Uh, and it's a real handicap in terms of learning very basic skills like how to talk. Uh, and, and here's my two cents on integrated classrooms, by the way. The assumption of most integrated classrooms is that just by putting a child with a disability next to a child without a disability, that child with a disability will learn from that child without a disability. It actually works beautifully with many kids with disabilities. Kids on the autism spectrum, not so much. Because they have very decreased skills in the imitation department. And unless you get in there and you do something about those skills, you teach kids how to imitate, that's, they're not going to be able to use that behavior throughout their lives. So we spend an awful lot of time with our very young kids working on imitation. Starting with things like, do this, do this. Do this. Um, working up to vocal imitation, imitating in a general classroom setting, and teaching them how to use imitation as a tool to learn from the natural environment. Joint attention is another one of those skills that typically developing kids just do automatically. We don't really know how they do it. It's just this magic that comes with neural development. And again, is a natural tool for learning. So joint attention is a three-way relationship between a communicator, a communication partner, and an object or an event in the environment. So if you're my communication partner and I said, what's that? What am I referring to? What's that? The camera. Yeah. How did you know? You were looking in that direction. Yeah, she watched my eye gaze and saw. She knew I was talking to her. I shifted. I looked back. I shifted again. She was like, oh, that thing. It's not that kids on the spectrum can't do it, but what we know is they do it only about 25% of opportunities that are available. And if you look at really good child development work just on language development, Hardin Risley did this phenomenal study on language development in indigenous populations in Alaska. And they basically determined that for a typically developing child to develop a typical fund of language, they need 10,000 joint attention opportunities a day. That's a lot of joint attention opportunities. But there are things going on around us all the time that we can notice and either we lead by drawing a communication partner's attention to something or our communication partner draws our attention to something and we learn from that. So a typically developing child starts to do something called proto-declarative pointing. When they're about a year old, they get their little pointy finger up and start pointing to things in the environment. And my daughter used to say, a sap, a sap mama, a sap, a sap, a sap, a sap, a sap, a sap, a sap. And just every single thing. What's the name of it? Uh, and kids learn language just from watching other people in the environment. And we become very sophisticated very early on at recognizing when someone's gaze shift is going to be able to give us information about what's going on and when it's not. So infants actually do this really interesting research where they have an infant that'll sit on its mom's lap and the, the researcher will sit across the table and they'll put an interesting toy at either end of the table. And the researcher will get the baby's attention and do a gaze shift. And the baby will 
do a gaze shift to look what the researcher is looking at. And then there's a very distinct point. I always forget when it is. I think it's when kids are like four or five months old. It's pretty early on. When if the researcher looks, closes their eyes and shifts, the baby doesn't gaze shift. They know that the researcher is not looking at anything because their eyes are closed. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, see, <laughs> next time you have somebody's baby, a little trick you can do. Um, yeah, so again, we use joint attention all the time uh, to gain information from the environment. And this is how that huge language explosion happens for very young kids when they go from having two or three words to having like 9,000 words in the course of just a few months. So if you're only able to recognize and use about 25% of those opportunities, you're at a pretty distinct disadvantage. Okay, so the next area, and this is one I will spend some time talking with you about because in, in your area of study here in this class in particular, this is an area I think where there's a lot of opportunity for exploration. And this is the area of restricted and repetitive patterns of behavior, interests, or activities. So folks on the autism spectrum, in order to be diagnosed with autism, you have to have at least two of these things. So stereotyped and repetitive motor movements. And for kids with very severe autism, we will often see kids who do a lot of rocking, hand flapping, um, spinning things. They'll do repetitive, non-functional activities with objects in their environment. So if you take two typically developing two-year-olds and sit them at a table and give them each a matchbox car, the typically developing kid is going to drive it around on the table, make little car noises, and the kid with autism is going to flip it upside down and spin the wheel and stare at it up the, out of the corner of their eye. Um, we have kids who do a lot of this with their hands over and over again. And for many kids, this is an all-consuming activity, these very repetitive behaviors. Now again, what we know about typical development is that your brain develops based on the vast array of activities that you are exposed to in the living of your life. If what you're doing is restricting yourself to just a very few activities, you're not being exposed to enough of, a, of an array to really maximize your development. So it's, a, it's another big problem. Um, and then there's this insistence on sameness, this inflexibility. And I think these two things can really compound. So if you have a kid who is um, very uh, prone to engaging in stereotyped behavior, and they also are very inflexible, when you try and break in and get them to do something different, they're going to be very resistant, uh, and often you'll see big problem behavior. Um, and you know, one of the things I often see in classrooms is that teachers begin to leave these kids alone because you get a really unpleasant reaction when you try and engage them. And what we know is that the more these kids are going to be left alone to engage in these very restricted patterns of behavior, the more difficult it's going to be to have that child engage in more, a, a more typical array of activities. Um, it affects cognitive development, it affects language development, it affects motor development. I mean, think of all the things that typically developing kids do to develop their physicality. Uh, and we've got kids who are not engaging in those things. Um, one, because often they have some, some gross motor in particular. Uh, delays. Often kids on the spectrum are a little bit clumsy in terms of gross motor skills, but then they've got these restricted and repetitive patterns of behavior that are sort of layered on top of that that can be a huge, huge problem. Um, what I see with our adolescents at the Grodin Center is that many of the kids have terrible posture. Um, when they're walking around, it's with their heads down. Uh, they often develop this interesting gait that, that I swear somebody needs to do a research study about this because I see it in many, many, many of our severely effective kids, where when they're walking, they're doing this. 
It looks very odd. Um, and if you think about how we get social information from our environment, it's when we're walking with our heads up and we're engaging with people. And if you're not doing that, if, if your gait that you've developed is this very downward gait, you're not getting that social information. You're not getting the same reaction out of people in your environment. Nobody's likely to initiate an interaction with you if that's how you're walking around. And I see it in, uh, in our folks with Asperger's who come into our clinic. I see it with our kids with really severe autism. I see it across the whole spectrum, these differences just in, in physical carriage that have an impact socially. Um, this also, I have to tell you, for folks um, who have higher functioning autism and Asperger's syndrome, is an also often an area that can make social inroads for them because we see kids who develop real pockets of expertise. Uh, so, um, you know, if you can sort of channel this with those kids into things that are likely career paths or, um, you know, areas that can help them to be assets among their peers, uh, it can be very helpful uh, in the social arena. Um, I'll tell you another funny story. My, the, the kid who got upset because the girl called him hot. I got called to his school another time because he was going to get suspended. And I'm thinking, what in the world could he have done to get suspended? He's like, never gets in trouble, ever. So he's sitting in the principal's office. And he was irritated, clearly, about this whole thing. He could not understand what the big deal was. Why were they making him sit there? Why did somebody call his mother? I, he doesn't understand. I said, well, what happened? Uh, it, so the principal says, he, he, t he was in one of the teacher's classrooms while she was out to lunch, and he took her computer apart. And he said, he was very exasperated, and he said, I was going to put it together, back together again, like I'd done all the other times. <laughs> and the principal was like, what? So apparently he'd had this pattern. He didn't like to go in the lunchroom because it was a very overwhelming social situation. So he'd find a classroom where the teacher wasn't, and he would disassemble and reassemble the computer. What's the big deal, right? And it wasn't, a, apparently he'd been doing it for three years. He was a junior, and no one had ever discovered him until that day, and now he was going to get, and that's, this is why he couldn't understand it, because he'd done this repeat, basically every day for three years, and why now was it going to get him in trouble? And he had a very particular interest in some particular component that he liked to see if it was in the computers, so he would take them apart. And then somehow while I was there talking to them, I had my laptop bag with me. He got on the subject of my laptop because he was not going to let the whole computer thing go and why this was okay for him to be interested in this and take it apart. And he said, can I take your laptop apart? No, you can't take my laptop apart. Well, I'll show you if it has that component. I'm not interested if it has that component. Well, he was and he wouldn't let it go. So I had to promise him that I would bring the, the manual. That's when they actually had printed computer manuals, which you can't get anymore. The next time I came, and sure enough, he was waiting for me a month later at the door, because he knew I was coming, to show him the manual. And he's like, yep, you've got it. OK, you're good to go. I can stop <laughs> harassing you about that. I imagine, I haven't seen the kid in probably 20 years. I imagine he's out there somewhere in the computer industry so doing his thing. Yeah. Um, taking apart unsuspecting people's computers. <laughs> so we, we did negotiate that all he had to do was apologize. And he was even PO'd about that because he did not understand what, what was the apology for. He hadn't done anything that was problematic. He was putting it back. To, the, the only problem was that someone had interrupted him before he got it back together again. That was the problem. It was not his behavior that was the problem. OK. So then um, continuing on in criterion B, so these restricted fixated interests that are abnormal in their intensity and focus. So um, you know, like my computer friend, that's the only thing he wanted to talk about. I worked with a little guy who only wanted to talk about the presidents of the United States. And when he was, he was in second grade. And when he was 
four, and he was just starting to talk, his parents thought it was great that he had this interest, and everybody, all of his relatives, would buy him more stuff about the President of the United States. Every birthday, every Christmas, he was inundated with more stuff, and he knew everything. And then he'd go out on the playground and run up to another second grader and say, do you know who Millard Fillmore's vice president was? And the other kids would run away. So um, we were able to, though, help him shift his interest to something that was a little more age appropriate, Pokemon cards, which have made a resurgence now, I understand. Um, and he became the go-to guy on the playground for Pokemon cards because he, within you know, the space of a couple of days, knew everything about them. All of their, they, they transform or something and they have powers and you can get things, yeah. People are nodding, you know, <laughs> what those are about. Yeah, so he knew everything. So he was the, the impartial judge whenever there was a dispute about what was going on with the Pokemon because he knew everything about it. So basically, we just had to keep teaching him a new, whatever the new craze was, we had to make sure he was the go-to guy. Um, I had another kid that I worked with, another second grader, Max, he was a great kid, really, really bright, loved science, loved, 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 loved science. The planets, dinosaurs, you name it, anything that had to do with science, he loved it, all factual information. And um, his teacher, was working with the kids on learning basic creative writing. And, and in second grade, they often use these things called story starters. So you get a little sentence that sort of starts off what you're supposed to do. So the sentence that he got one day was, you wake up in the morning, you look out your bedroom window, and there's a dinosaur in your backyard. And he refused to write. Wasn't going to do it. What's the problem, Max? It can't happen. Dinosaurs are extinct. But what if it did happen? Wouldn't that make it even more surprising? No. It can't happen. It's, it's never going to happen. Dinosaurs are extinct. He, a thousand facts about dinosaurs. You will never look out your window and there be a dinosaur. Well, will you at least write one sentence about it? No. I'm not going to write about something that's stupid. Wouldn't do it, wouldn't do it, wouldn't do it. The teacher was very exasperated. And this wasn't the first time they had had this conversation. This happened over and over and over again. And he finally said to me one day, when I was trying to drag him through yet another creative writing assignment, he said, Dr. Jane, you just have to understand, I don't have an imagination. And he was unconcerned by that. He thought it was frivolous. He, I'm sure he would have used the word frivolous. <laughs> he didn't use it in that conversation, but he had many large vocabulary words. But yeah, he didn't see that as a problem. It was the facts all the time. All the time. It also got him into trouble because he would never remember people's names because that was a fact that was sort of lost on him. So he'd you know, be talking to other kids and he'd go, hey, fat kid. <laughs> Say, Max, you need, to, you need to say, excuse me, or I'm sorry I don't remember your name. He'd say, why? He's fat. He knows he's fat. So it can get you in a lot of trouble to have Asperger's syndrome. Um, difficulties with sensory input. We were just having a big discussion about this today because we were talking about this kid with significant autism who he's just um, gaining some words. He's eight years old. Um, he can say no, which is great now, because um, he couldn't say that before. And he's got a couple of other word approximations. And he randomly has these freak out tantrums where he will literally come at you like he's trying to rip your face off. And we discovered that they're all associated with like the sudden onset of some mechanical sound. The fan in the bathroom. Somebody using a leaf blower two blocks away. Somebody mowing the lawn. God forbid the truck comes to empty the dumpster out in the parking lot. He's all over you. He has this incredibly hypersensitivity to these sounds. And he has no way of processing them or communicating effectively. And what he does is attack the person who's nearest to him. 
Now for him, what that usually results in is him being removed from the situation, which then ends his exposure to the noise. So we're actually inadvertently reinforcing this behavior by removing him when he has this tantrum. So we had this big discussion about how we were gonna help him get to the point where he could independently recognize that we're, there was a sound that bothered him, stay calm enough to get a pair of noise-canceling headphones to throw on so he didn't have to hear it anymore. So that was the long-term goal for him. Uh, so we had to get somehow from, I hear a sound, I'm gonna try and kill you, to I hear a sound, I'm gonna keep it together, get my strategy, and, and be good. Um, you also see folks who are hyposensitive, so they don't seem to react to things like pain. Um, we had a kid in one of our group homes who broke his leg, he slipped on the ice, broke his leg, got back from the emergency room with the cast on his leg, and was jumping up and down on both feet in the living room, broke the cast, had to go back, actually get surgery because now he had displaced the fracture that he had, and, and they basically had to keep him very medicated while this healed because he did not seem to respond to the pain of a broken leg. So obviously that's extreme, but we see things like that uh, with folks on the spectrum. It's, it's interesting, uh, and we don't quite know what it is that, that is driving that, particularly either hypersensitivity or hyposensitivity. You'll see kids who only want to wear a certain kind of clothing, can't stand tags. Um, I worked with a kid who never wore socks ever. He just could not stand to have them on his feet. And um, people used to talk with his mother all the time because in the winter, he'd come in with no socks on and they were like, oh, that mother, she's terrible. Why doesn't she put socks on her kid? <laughs> I'm like, you know what, he made it to school. <laughs> That's really good. Um, but yeah, he wasn't having it. He wasn't gonna have socks on. I had another kid who could not go in the school cafeteria because the, the smell would just, well, it overwhelms the best of us, but and the, all of us, but he would go in there and he just, he, he literally could not handle it and he would get nauseated and, and uh, have to leave, so he ate his lunch in the guidance office his whole three years of middle school because he just couldn't ever deal with the cafeteria. We have uh, folks with a lot of food sensitivities um, that uh, won't eat certain textures, um, won't eat whole categories of food. I worked with a kid who only ate white food. Um, remarkably, there's quite an array of, of white food out there that you can, I mean, cauliflower, the inside of apples. Did she? Yeah, white food? She had cream cheese and white bread. Mmm. <laughs> my daughter eliminated orange foods for a while, but she says it's my fault because she used to, we, we lived in, on Long Island and we'd take the ferry over to um, visit her grandparents and she used to get sick on the ferry, so I would give her chewable Dramamine and they were orange. So she says it's my fault. No, it's, yeah. she wouldn't eat any orange things. So yeah. a question about a boy who didn't respond to a broken leg. I wonder whether he responds to milder pain, not something so painful, because it could be an information overload. Yeah, he didn't, he didn't really seem to. He was not a kid who we ever, you know, we sort of had not thought about it with him until this very dramatic event happened. But then we were talking about it. He was never a kid who seemed to get hurt or get bothered, like if he had a little scrape or something. Interesting, so not at all, not if you poach a poke or just pinch something. He didn't like to be touched. Oh, I don't know. But we were never sure if that was social or if that was a, a sensory. Yeah thing, but yeah, he didn't, he didn't really like people in his space. But yeah, he was not a kid who would uh, react when, when he was sick. You know, you'd notice he was sick if, you know, his face was red or something, and then they'd take his temperature and be like, oh, he's got a fever. He didn't re seem to respond to a lot of those stimuli. There's actually some research on, on kids, um, a fair number of kids with significant autism also have some pretty significant problem behavior, like aggression and self-injury. And for kids with really significant self-injury, and I'm talking about kids who hit themselves, uh, you know, bite themselves hundreds of times a day. Those kids often have um, changes that you can see in the innervation of their, their dermis. And, but nobody's ever really sure if that's what allows them to continue to engage in self-injury or if that's a change that is the result of 
years and years of chronic self-injurious behavior. Um, but, yeah, go ahead. Uh, something that I'm interested in is grounding techniques help um, for triggers in people with, say, PTSD. Would similar techniques help for hypersensitivity um, in order to block out stimulus that could be perceived as harmful? It's possible. There's not a lot of literature in that area, um, but it certainly seems reasonable for people who cognitively are able to participate in that kind of a, a clinical relationship and to learn that kind of a skill. Yeah. That's all right. That sounds very weird. Oh. <laughs> this is a very cool building, by the way. Um, okay, so here's some other stuff. So the symptoms have to be, it's a developmental disability, which means that the symptoms have to be present in the developmental period. And for kids on the autism spectrum, that's really prior to age three. And what we know now is a really good diagnostician can diagnose autism very reliably when kids are a year to 18 months old. So we've made a lot of strides in early diagnosis over the years. Um, Asperger's syndrome is a little trickier to pick up um, because typically kids have to have uh, a verbal repertoire in place, though many of those kids are precocious verbally. Um, they need, symptoms need to be clinically significant. So they actually do need to cause some sort of an impairment. So, you know, a lot of the things when I talk about Asperger's, people say, well, I know a lot of people who, who have little oddities. Um, but if it's not an impairment, if it's not causing you a problem socially or with your occupation or in another area of functioning, it doesn't meet criteria for a disorder. And then you have to not be able, this is the principle of parsimony, you have to not be able to explain them by some simpler explanation like the, the child has an intellectual disability. And that's why, and we do see there is symptom overlap. So kids with um, what we used to call mental retardation, what we now call intellectual disability, often have some symptoms that are similar to, to kids with autism. So if it's better explained by intellectual disability, then you go with that diagnosis. They do frequently co-occur. So you can diagnose both. Okay, skip over that, specifiers. Okay, so let's look at some common characteristics again. Okay, so many kids on the spectrum have strengths. A lot of kids have very strong visual spatial skills, much stronger than, than other skill areas. Um, so often visual supports can be helpful for folks or, or visual learning tools can be very helpful. Um, often a very strong, as in my friend Max's case, factual rote memory. So if they know something, they really know it. Um, I have learned that if a, if a kid with Asperger's tells me something is true, I should never question it because it will be true. All I have to do is Google it and confirm it. Um, with folks with Asperger's, they often have average or above average IQs. So these are, these are kids who are bright. And this is what Kanner thought in the 40s when he was first looking at kids, even with more significant autism, was that they seem to have, that's okay, they seem to have um, some innate intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> um, but for folks with Asperger's, uh, it's always above average or, uh, average or above average intelligence. Very strong vocabularies, um, but again, without that social communication piece. Uh, and you know, that, that social communication is interesting because it's, it's even subtle things like the emphasis that you put on a word in a sentence can, can throw someone with 
high functioning autism or Asperger. So um, Tony Atwood, a uh, guy who writes a lot about Asperger's, one of the sentences that he uses to demonstrate this is, um, I didn't say she stole my wallet. 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 It has a different meaning, every word that you put emphasis on. So it's, yeah, you know, now the, in the electronic age, has anyone ever had the experience where you send a text message or an email and someone misinterprets it? Yes, because there's no social information. So it's like living your life in text. There's no social information that's helping you interpret the meaning of that message. So you can have the biggest vocabulary in the world and have a very difficult time figuring out what people are actually saying to you. Um, and then a, a great strength that often we can use when we're, when we're working towards careers with kids is that these are kids that can be very passionate about their topics of interest. Um, we have a guy that works with us now at one of our programs doing data entry, and um, he plays in bands on the weekend. He plays in like three different bands. And I was, you know, I was talking with another musician friend of mine about this kid, not that I was talking about him, but we were talking about how challenging it must be for him because that's a very social environment when you're playing in a band. You know, people want to talk to you before, people want to talk to you after. You're standing in front of a whole lot of people. So I actually went to see him play. He is an incredibly technically proficient bass player. And he does not look at anybody while he's playing. He just, he literally stands there in one spot. He does not move. He plays like you would not believe and stares at the ceiling. And he's in demand, because he's really good. Um, and he's, he'll talk with you about playing the bass, too. Very, very passionate about it. But he looks a little strange on stage. Um, but he doesn't care, because he's doing something he loves. Um, other things you'll see, very short attention span. A lot of kids, we try not to sort of uh, comorbidly diagnose ADHD with autism spectrum disorder, because we know that folks with autism have short attention spans. It doesn't seem to be the same as otherwise typically developing folks who have ADD or ADHD. <coughs> Difficulty with organizing information. Um, we see a lot of even really bright kids who have very difficult time with what we call executive functioning. So getting started with something, getting organized to do a task, um, keeping their books together for school, um, getting assignments done on time, um, those kind of things. Uh, difficulty focusing on relevant information. Um, they're, they're tree people, not forest people typically, so we'll get hung up on little details and not necessarily be able to synthesize that into a big picture. Very concrete thinking, which again can get them into a lot of trouble socially because often there's one way of thinking about everything. It's very black and white, no gray. Um, and then difficulty with generalizing newly acquired skills. So I actually had a mom of a kid with autism say to me, why do I have to teach her every single thing? And it's a difficulty with generalization. We as humans, automatically when we learn a new skill, try it out in a bunch of different areas. And many kids with autism don't do that naturally. So that's another one of those skills that they really need to learn. Um, and we see a very wide range of intellectual functioning. So for, from kids who have very, very significant impairments, who are nonverbal and non-communicative, who are, are unable to care for even their most basic needs, to you know, your local physics professor who's you know, doing very well. I hate to pick on the physics guys, but it's kind of true. Mm -hmm. um, again, those executive functioning challenges. So, you know, you might have somebody who's really bright and really capable who cannot manage their household uh, because they just can't organize the things that it takes to do grocery shopping and laundry and balance your checkbook and all of that stuff. Um, often because there's more interesting things going on all the time. 
Um, and then a very fundamental difficulty with taking the perspective of another person. Um, and this is something that you'll hear referred to as theory of mind. And that's my understanding that you have a thought that's independent of mine and that impacts the way that you react to a situation. And um, one of the classic tests that they use to demonstrate this is something called the Sally Ann test. So in the Sally Ann test, there's a girl named Sally who's sitting at a table and she has a small teddy bear. And in front of her are an upturned, an overturned box and an overturned basket. And Ann walks in and stands next to Sally. Sally takes the bear and puts it under the basket. Ann leaves. While Ann is not in the room, Sally takes the bear out from under the basket and puts it under the box. Ann comes back in. And the question is, where will Ann look for the bear? Well, if you have <laughs> autism, you'll probably say under the butt. <laughs> yes, Though 90% of the population would say under the basket. Pretty much any kid Very over the right. age of three will say under the basket. And if you ask them why, they'll say because that's where Anne saw her put it. Adults with Asperger's will say under the box. Well, why would she look for it under the box? Because that's where it is. But she didn't see it there. No, but that's where it is. So where will she look for it? Under the box. OK, let's walk through it. Anne came in and saw it go under the basket. Then she left and came back in. Where would she look for it? Under the box. Why would she look for it under the box? Because that's where it is. OK, she didn't see. Anne didn't see Sally move it. Doesn't matter. That's where it is. So really simple tasks that require perspective taking um, are often very, very difficult uh, for folks on the spectrum. So what's the person think? What are they thinking when they go yeah. to the box? <laughs> that's, that's the problem. The, the, the person with Asperger's is literally not able to step in the shoes of the person who's seeing what's happening, cannot understand that that person has a different perspective than what they have seen in that simple a task. So even simple things like why is a child crying? Let's say you know you show somebody a picture of a kid with an ice cream on the ground and the child is crying. Why is the child crying? I don't know. Well, look at what's going on in the picture. Do you see there there there's an ice cream on the ground in front of them? Yep. Why do you think the child might be crying? I don't know. Is that more prevalent in Aspergers? Well, they're, they can describe. They can describe it so you can you're understanding it better. Yeah, it, it's, you see it across the whole spectrum. So we'll, you know, for kids who are um, lower functioning, we'll literally see kids who, who will sort of you know, just barge through a crowd of people with no recognition that you know, somebody might be standing in the way or want something that they want or, or grab things from people. and no recognition that that individual may somehow be invested in that interaction. Um, so yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty pervasive. Um, a lot of folks with, with Asperger's describe themselves as visual thinkers. So, and uh, Temple Grandin, who's a famous person with Asperger's, uh, wrote a book actually called Thinking in Pictures. Are you? Um, She's, if, if you get a chance, check her. Uh, I mean, she speaks very frequently nationally. You can see her, as my mother calls it, on the YouTube. Um, <laughs> um, she'll call me sometimes. Your brother told me to go on the YouTube and watch that video of you. I'm like, Mom, it's not a thing. It's just YouTube. She can't get it. Um, <laughs> OK, so what are some speech and language challenges? So um, we do have a lot of kids who are nonverbal or don't acquire language spontaneously. Now, this is an interesting advance that we've made in the field. When I started in the field, 50% um, of kids with autism never learned how to speak. And they never did. They were functionally mute their whole lives. Now, with really good intervention, 
about 85% of kids with autism will learn how to use at least functional verbal language. So at least enough language to get their basic needs met. And many, many more kids become conversant because we're much, much better at knowing what to teach and when to teach it in terms of language acquisition. And we're doing things like teaching imitation and joint attention so kids are able to use more natural learning opportunities in their environment. We see lots of kids with what's called echolalia, which is just the sort of reflexive repeating of what it is that other people say. Um, so if I said, hello, Emma, she would just repeat back, hello, Emma. And it would just go on like that. We have kids who have what we call delayed echolalia. So they'll recite an entire television show. Um, or what they heard their parents say last night when they were arguing. Um, but it's a sort of reflexive behavior. It's not the same as intentional imitation. Uh, it's a very reflexive uh, behavior uh, and doesn't on its own develop into functional language. Though I have worked with some kids who seem to use entirely delayed echolalia to communicate. So they'll pick phrases from various movies and TV shows that they've watched to communicate what they need in various situations. So there are kids who do learn to use it functionally. Um, verbal expression, uh, you know, again, if you think of all the social communicative difficulties, um, being able to express yourself verbally in, in uh, any sort of abstract way uh, can be very challenging, very, very challenging. Okay. Well, we talked about all this stuff already, didn't we? Oh, voice regulation problems. We'll often have kids who are really loud talkers or speak in sort of a monotone, um, so they're not using appropriate inflection when they're talking. Um, I've heard people describe it as sort of the robot voice. Kids with autism learn how to talk. They sound very robotic because um, they're, not, they're not picking up on those social cues that allow them to use an inflection appropriately. Um, implied meaning in language. We used to do a lot of joke telling <laughs> <laughs> Just a second. So um, joke telling classes with kids high, with high functioning autism and we would bring in literally like the, the kids page from the Sunday paper which has these really simple jokes on the back um, and, and have the kids work through telling why, saying why it's funny. And it's one of the most painful experiences I've ever had in my life is sitting in those groups where kids are literally trying to, like a really simple joke like, why can't a Dalmatian play hide and seek? because it's always spotted. <laughs> Why is that funny? <laughs> it's really not. <laughs> you know, why would people think that's funny? And you know, it's this sort of academic exercise of pulling apart the verbal structure of this joke to say why it's funny. And by the time you've done that, it's really not funny anymore. <laughs> So you can imagine how tricky that is then if you're in the typical high school with the kind of verbal interaction that goes on and that kid is back on, you know, joke or idiom number one trying to figure out what that kid was saying and everybody else has moved on in the conversation. Um, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so I'm studying cognitive neuroscience and a lot of what you're telling us fits straight into an intro classes curriculum. And something that I wondered about echolalia is, it sounds a lot like the Chinese room experiment, where you have a manual on how to respond to certain cues and don't actually understand your response. Is, can that be the situation with people with autism? Could it be that they're just regurgitating things that they've observed as being conventional to say? How are you? Fine being a good example? Um, it's possible with straight up echolalia, they, you'd say, how are you? They would literally just say, how are you? In exactly the same tone and inflection that you said it. Um, and it's, it's typically with more significantly impaired kids. So I don't know that, there, that anyone on the spectrum with echolalia has sort of been able to give enough information about what's going on for us to sort of figure that out. It's possible, and there, you know, I know a, a number of adults with Asperger's syndrome who, you know, what you're saying is absolutely true, where they sort of learned 
that you have to say this response to this thing that comes up in the social environment because that's what everybody expects you to do. So you just do it. Um, and then our, um, you know, have a really difficult time with more spontaneous language. They're very good with the road. Actually, an interesting thing, my dad a few years ago had a stroke in his left thalamus and could do very standard rote conversations. But you'd ask him a, a different question. No, so I could give him the cell phone. He'd talk to my daughter. She'd say, hi, Grandpa. He'd say, hi, hi, baby. How you doing? Good, how are you? What are you doing today? OK, good. So he'd do these very standard things. And it was basically because that still, I don't know how to describe it, existed in his damaged brain as an, an appropriate response. But nothing that was sort of spontaneous and novel could come out. So depending on where the neurological damage is, perhaps. Children will, well, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> that, uh, ASD people, they basically can't, they can perceive specific information details, but have problem putting everything together as an entire entity. So for example, they can pay great attention to details, and they enjoy doing that, but they suffer from seeing the whole picture. So they suffer from uh, um, putting things together and just making things as a as coherent as one piece. So some people are saying this argument, this proposed, uh, proposing this hypothesis, believes that uh, ASD is not a social deficit. It's simply a, a problem with information processing. And social scenarios, they have the most sophisticated patterns that even more sophisticated than visual patterns. So people, uh, the, so that's why they show some deficits in social interaction, but it's not because it's something specific to social, it's because social is the most complex and requires holistic processing. That's another explanation. So it's a different it's different from the Chinese room hypothesis, but I think it's a more complex. Yeah, and a uh, 2004 paper by Mark J. Brosnan says that uh, there is a deficit in gestalt processing in autistic people, which is a See, he wasn't problem. kidding when he told me at the beginning that he was going to be Googling things as they went yeah. around. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, well, that, that is uh, an hypothesis that you hear a lot of conversation about now at, at conferences. So it'll be interesting to see how that sort of plays out uh, over time in terms of, you know, one of the things that I always think is, okay, um, that's that's a, an interesting hypothesis. Can you convert that into because I'm a I'm a treatment person. I'm in practice treating it every day. How do you convert that into an intervention that can help us make better progress for for uh, for kids? All right. So I know you've gone through a lot of this stuff already. So what can you what can you do about it? So here's here's things you can do and things you can buy, and um, I can tell you that there's no empirical support for any of the things on this, this list. Yeah, well, and, and you know, a lot of people think, well, we'll do some of these things because they're really kind of benign. Why not? Wouldn't you try anything? Well, they're not so benign. So for example, vitamin A in high doses causes irreversible liver damage. So you might think, oh, I read an article about vitamin A. I heard that on Good Morning America. I'll give my kid a ton of vitamin A. Not so benign. And often parents are doing things without talking with their doctor about it. Um, I had a mom who was literally getting in the mail these, you know those dissolvable paper things that you can get them with like Listerine on them, you put them on your tongue and they go away, yeah. that were infused with who knows what. And she had never met this guy who was sending them, so she'd send him a check and he'd send her another pack of things. So she had to call one. him, yeah. no, and she had to call him once a month and tell him about how her son was doing, and then he'd send her a new batch that might be different from that. That sounds totally sketchy. And I said, does your pediatrician know that you're doing this? No. You know, crazy, crazy things. Did you find out what was missing? No. No, she never had any idea what was in them. Is that legal? Did she 
she probably found it on the internet, <laughs> you know. Um, you know, she told me, I, I gave her my best spiel about, you know, evidence-based practice and really needing to know, and um, she told me, well, she and her husband had talked about it and they decided they were going to give it a year. I was like, wow, that's a long time. Um, so social and educational and behavioral interventions, again, there's a ton of things out there. Again, on the internet, you know, 17 million things that you can look at. Uh, and the vast majority of them have no evidence to support their effectiveness in producing any sort of meaningful change in folks with autism. Um, but they're all out there. People will sell you all kinds of things. A, a, a colleague of mine always refi refers to everything as this broad category of things you can buy. There are a lot of things you can buy. Um, one of my personal favorites is there's a guy who um, uh, sells this uh, CD and apparently you play it while your child is asleep and it turns on the, the eight developmental switches in your brain. So, so there are eight developmental switches in your brain and this turns on. And the reason that he knows that it works is because he used to have autism. And I, I was talking about this with my staff one day because I would sort of run these little talks. Right? So one of my staff people goes, so did he invent the CD to treat his own autism and then he cured himself with it so now he can sell it to people? I don't know how the whole process worked, but that was, that was his evidence. I mean, now he has a light, too, so you can get the CD for, for nighttime, but then you can get the light that you can turn on during the daytime, too, so you don't just have to do the treatment at night. It can be both day and night. Um, so, but what do, you, what do we really need to do? <laughs> well, what we really need to do is address the core features um, and do it in, in a reasonable, intensive way using methods that have been empirically demonstrated to actually produce change. Um, so we need to look at building imitation skills. And I'll tell you, when Emma has been over to do um, the dance stuff with our kids at the center, it's been remarkable to me to see these kids who have very impaired imitation because they're doing something that's really enjoyable and you know the music that they pick is really fun and lively are doing these imitation tasks that are very difficult uh, for them to do. Um, you know those joint attention opportunities can I look at a teacher and figure out what they're talking about? Can I look at a peer and gain information from them in, there in, in the environment? Communication that's central to everything we really need to work on building communication skills. Um, core cognitive skills we do a lot of uh, developing things that we call equivalence class learning, um, using a lot of visual matching tasks, and uh, um, so it's you know it looks simple here, but it's pretty intense and complex. Working on developing social behavior, and again, you know, is, as you pointed out, is it a social deficit? Well, what we know is that we see social behavior that is not lacking. So I'm a behavior analyst, so it doesn't necessarily matter to me as the interventionist what the problem is, it's can I do something to change it, that behavior, to build a behavior that's going to help the individual to function better in their environment. And then working on those restricted repetitive patterns of behavior. Um, and uh, you know, this, this all leads into sort of quality of life things. And one of, my, one of my big beefs, and this is one of the things I talked to Rachel about when she first invited me to that panel, <laughs> was that um, don't ask me to come up and talk about dance therapy because one of my pet peeves is that everybody calls everything therapy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? Can it just be dance like it is for every other kid? Can it just be art like it is for every other kid? Can it just be horseback riding like it is for every other kid? And some kids really like that. And for the kids who really like that, that's going to be a vehicle for them to learn all kinds of other things. So, you know, I think if I could give you one takeaway is that I, I love what you guys are doing and I think it's really valuable just to expose kids with, with ASDs to something that could potentially be beneficial for their motor development because we know a lot of these kids have really significant 
motor issues. And actually at that panel two years ago, I had a very interesting conversation with the gymnastics coach from MIT. Oh, right. Yeah. Noah. Yeah, who um, basically MIT has just boatloads of money. So they had built this huge athletic facility and he was the gymnastics coach, but they wanted him to develop other things to do. So he had developed all these little classes and he was fi finding that many of the MIT students who were coming to take his classes couldn't do like a simple forward roll. And many of them were also on the autism spectrum. Um, People with ASDs are overrepresented in the MIT population. Yeah. It is a well-known fact. Yeah, so he was, he, you know, he was very interested in this because he had real first-hand experience with, you know, very academically talented folks who literally couldn't skip because um, they just did not have the motor coordination or the motor planning to be able to carry out some of those very basic developmental physical tasks. So getting kids involved in more physical activity is very, very interesting to me. And I think it, it is linked with better long-term outcomes because kids, uh, you know, our physical presence sends a message to the social world. So if, you know, if my posture is good and my gait is fine and I stand up straight and I look at you and I approach you, I'm much more likely to get typical social feedback than if I'm like this because I literally have not done anything in my whole life except this in the corner of my room. That has to affect your motor outcome. You know, it, it, it can't be typical when you're not exposing yourself to that whole array of activities. So I think, you know, the kinds of activities that, that you guys are engaging in um, are ultimately going to be helpful in that way and also in just helping folks develop a, a typical array of interests, exposing folks to enough choices so that they can find things that are going to enhance their quality of life. And that's what habilitation is all about. All of us, as we grow to adulthood and beyond, are engaged in our own personal habilitation. And basically what habilitation means is that you are trying to maximize positive reinforcement and minimize punishment in your environment. So you're engaged in a broad enough array of things so that you can select the good things and avoid the bad things. But you have to have enough things going on in your environment to be able to be a fully functional adult. So the more kinds of things that we can expose kids to, um, the better. So, do you have to call it therapy so you can get paid for doing it? Probably. No. Should you have to? No. And hopefully we'll move away from that. You don't get paid? Is that what you said? No, I said we were talking about how we don't like the term therapy either a couple weeks ago. Yeah. I really don't like it. Yeah. And how often it is used to like legitimate, make it legitimate what you're doing. If insurance would actually pay for our therapy, then I think we'd be willing to call it therapy while working on that. But right now, insurance doesn't pay for it. And therapy is a general detractor, so. Yeah. But I bet that people like you, working with people like me, could come up with protocols that we could justify to specifically work on those restricted and repetitive patterns of behavior, those motor functioning things that would be paid for. Well, and that's the direction we're going. And that's why a crazy behavior analyst like me is happy to be here <laughs> talking to people like you. Well, thank you. And then this is just some resources, then I'm going to give you the two second spiel about uh, the Grodin Center. Um, Okay, more than two seconds on the Grown Center. Um, so these are some resources for evidence-based practice. Uh, uh, the, the first one, published in 2001, is actually from the National Academy of Sciences. It was a consensus document on educating children with autism. It's a good one. Um, it's sort of general, but helpful, and a lot of parents have been able to use it to advocate for um, very core features of their children's educational programs. 
the National Standards Project is something that I'm personally involved in. I'm one of their expert panelists. Actually, the National Standards Project 2 is coming out. You can download their products for free if you pay for a lot of printer ink, or you can just write them a check and buy one, or they might even have that PayPal thing. Um, but they produced the report, which is long and uh, technical. But you can read that. They also produce a book of information for educators and a book of information for parents to help parents sift through the 71 million hits and figure out what actually has empirical support and what doesn't. Um, the Association for Autism Treatment, actually it's the Association for Science and Autism Treatment, asatonline.org um, also is a tremendous resource for figuring out what actually has empirical support and what doesn't. Um, and then the National Professional Development Center on ASDs. So this is their consensus document, which again you can download if you have a lot of printer ink. So the Grodin Network, I passed out a couple of our brochures. Um, the Grodin Network is, um, I have a very long-term relationship with the Grodin Network because I grew up here in Providence and I went to classical high school uh, across the city. And um, when I was a junior, this, so this will give you a little context. When I was in high school, in gym class, you had to wear these blue one-piece gym suits that were really not attractive. And when you're in high school, we had co-ed gym, and the boys did not have to wear strange uniforms. They could wear gym shorts and t-shirts, and the girls all had to wear these one-piece blue gym suits. So it was an interesting social environment. So at the end of my junior year, a friend of mine came up to me and said, you know, we can get out of gym next year if we do this internship thing. Where do I sign up? <laughs> and I actually ended up doing my internship at a very tiny school for kids with autism called the Behavioral Development Center, uh, which had two classrooms. It was in a small building in a parking lot behind what was then the Rhode Island School for the Deaf on the east side of Providence. And it has grown since 1976 into what's the Grodin Network now, which, and we serve about 650 individuals with autism a day um, in all of our programs. So we have everything basically from uh, early intervention, diagnostic services, early intervention for very young kids, to a full array of adult services. Um, we have, we're made up of four corporations, so there's the Grodin Center, which is where I work, and that is services for people who are 21 and under in Rhode Island. So we have early intervention, um, an integrated preschool program, we have two school buildings for um, kids with significant autism and severe problem behavior who are around 6 to 21 years old. We have um, Respite services, we're actually the largest respite provider in Rhode Island to families of kids on the spectrum. Uh, we have home-based therapeutic services. Uh, we have a clinic-based ABA program. Um, we have community support services, which includes our outpatient clinic, uh, where families come in, can come in and do family therapy or individual therapy. We also have a lot of groups for um, particularly teenagers with uh, Asperger's syndrome. We have sibling groups that we run out of that program. They also do our school consultation, and um, we do a lot of speaking engagements around trainings for other professionals in the area. Um, so that's the Grodin Center. Oh, we also have therapeutic foster care and residential care for kids with autism. Um, the Cove Center is our Rhode Island programs for adults with autism. Uh, so we have a whole array of vocational um, day service and residential options so adults can live in group homes or they can live in family homes. Um, and we also do um, a program out of that uh, facility called Enhanced Outpatient Services, which is for folks with autism who are living at home who may be having behavioral difficulties and need professionals to come in for a short period of time and help their family sort of sort things out. We also run um, vocational services for folks with Asperger's syndrome out of that program. We have this program called the Job Club, which is for young adults with Asperger's to help them learn um, the, the social skills that you need to be successful in the workforce. Um, and then we have a new collaboration with a group called Dean's List, which is um, 
basically a community-based program that's working on um, a variety of vocational and community relationships between businesses and, and organizations that serve people with disabilities. So that's the Cove Center. In Massachusetts, we have a program called Halcyon Center or Behavioral Associates of Massachusetts, which is our adult services in Massachusetts. And then we have a charter school in, uh, uh, I guess it's in Wakefield, Saunders Town, which is a typical charter school. It's actually the number, number two charter school in Rhode Island. It's K through five. And their charter is on integrated programming. So we tend to have about 25% of the population down there who are on the spectrum. What's the name of that? Kingston Hill Academy. Um, we are, uh, we employ what we call evidence-based practice. So that basically means that all of us, when we approach a problem, approach it in the same way. We identify the problem that we're dealing with, whether it's a skill that needs to be taught or a behavior that needs to be reduced. We do an assessment of that behavior. We develop an hypothesis as to what is driving that behavior for that individual or, or what is causing the deficit. We rely on our knowledge of the empirical literature to select intervention and then we monitor through data collection uh, and if we're if we've chosen well and everything's going in the right direction great if not it becomes a big feedback loop where you look at the problem again do another assessment pick another reasonable intervention based on your hypothesis and keep going around until we're successful um, we um, also the Groton Center has sort of uh, made its international reputation on innovation. So we've also incorporated a lot of um, cognitive behavioral techniques that you typically see employed with otherwise typically developing folks into our interventions. We're very well known for our use of self-control strategies, which we think is really important for the population that we serve. So we do a lot of relaxation training, a lot of cognitive Im imagery procedures. So uh, we're helping folks not only to reduce their behavior through behavioral means, but to learn self-control, so to identify their own triggers. What is it that stresses out that individual kid? Can we teach them to identify that stressor and on their own, without the support of anyone else, be able to manage that in a reasonable way? Um, and you know, we really think that helps our individuals ultimately with more independent functioning uh, because they're not relying on other people to come in and manage those stressful situations for them. They're learning, and it's a long-term process, but they're learning to manage those things on their own. Um, you guys are coming for a tour. Now, when you guys get there, because your class is late, most of our kids will be gone, but there'll be a group there that's at their after-school program. But you'll be able to see the classrooms, and you'll be able to see some of their kids doing their after-school programming, and I can show you some of how some of these programs look um, for some of these kids when you come on Thursday. So, we also have lots of jobs available. So, <laughs> if you're ever looking for a part time job. <laughs> Is there anything that they should know, we should know before we go on, on Thursday? Anything you want? Um, you may see kids engaged in problem behavior. The kids who stay for after school program are the kids who live in our residential homes, so they're kids with more significant disabilities, um, kids with aggression, kids with self injury. So. You may see a child having a tantrum and staff intervening in that. Um, you know, we'll, if that's going on, obviously we won't stay there. Um, but as we're moving around the building, you may see what is um, some things like that. For, this um, for our kids, we try and do like a little educational, recreational sort of group. So they'll split up into groups, and sometimes they'll do a, like a cooking group or an art group or something in the gym. Um, if the weather's nice, I think it's supposed to rain on Thursday, but if the weather's nice, they'll spend some extra time out. We have a new playground facility that the kids really love. And how long is that the after school program? Uh, well, it's usually 45 minutes to an hour every day. So we get the, the kids who come just for the day off on their buses. The after school kids stay a little later and then they uh, take our Groden buses out to their and group what, homes. What is the timing of it? So um, it starts at, what time are you guys arriving? Our kids leave on their school buses at 2.30, so that'll go until about 3.15, 3.30 after school programs. Oh, so, so if you can get right over, so yeah. Um, it literally takes like two minutes yeah, from here. Yeah, so I think you probably won't get there much. Let's, everyone just get there as soon as you can. 
I will send you a message saying if you can get there, we'll tell you. Okay, we'll be there. Yeah. 2.30 at the very latest, though, yeah. because that is our class. Yeah. Time, so we should be there for 2 .30. Don't be late on Tuesday, Thursday, unless the bus is out of state. <laughs> is there a bus? No, no, we're just going to be that car. Yeah. I have some really, really nice news. So I've been doing some more fact checking. And in yeah. 2009, uh -huh. um, the French Parliament passed a law very similar to the IDA. Oh. And as of the beginning of this school year, every region in France has an um, autism resource center that has trainers to train professors in their continuing education on working with kids with autism. They're also providing um, awesome. personalized... Well, are they teaching them psychoanalysis, or are they teaching them something actually useful? Something useful, I think. Oh, good. <laughs> but um, they also have a special mentorship program where every school will have one uh, quote-unquote disabilities counselor. and. Basically, they're training their teachers in TEACH, uh, ADA, PETS, and Mapathon, which are more or less good systems. So. All right. Well, that's oh. very good news. Yeah. Before you leave it's it up, Silver, I'd um, say thank you to Jane for coming. Thank you. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Thanks for having me. It's been fun.